Okay, so the great beauty of the white wheel arrangement system that we're all familiar with is its simplicity because these four locomotives, even though they are different in their nature, are all identified by either 040 or 040T. The great weakness with the white wheel arrangement notation is its simplicity because even though these locomotives are to a greater or lesser extent fundamentally different, they're all identified as 040 or 040T. Now, weakness or not, simplicity or not, we know from our vantage point looking back over 123 years of history that the white wheel arrangement system is notoriously well known and you might be forgiven for thinking that because it is so notoriously well known, its acceptance as the way of identifying locomotives would have been relatively straightforward. It wasn't, and it makes an interesting story, hopefully. In mid-1901, the American Association of Railway Master Mechanics had their conference, and the year previously, they had invited one of their members to present a paper on a system for standard classification of locomotives. And Mr. Sanderson of Topeka, not sure what road he was associated with, but we could probably take an educated guess, presented the paper. Now, classification can mean any number of things. We could be talking about the wheel arrangement, whether or not it's a mixed service locomotive, a passenger locomotive, or a freight drag locomotive. Could be we're talking about the classification that each road uses to identify their locomotives. It could be we're talking about the common names that serve to identify locomotives. What Mr. Sanderson was after was a system that amalgamated all of those factors into one system that could be universally adopted. Now, the master mechanic threw a bunch of railway locomotive bods who knew what a 10-wheeler, a consolidation, a mogul, an 8-wheeler, an American a standard or an eight-wheeled American standard to use its full name were when they saw one. The trouble was that advances in metallurgy, ad advances in lubrication, upticking of the weight of rail and thereby an upticking of axle loading and uplift in tonnage demands had seen the proliferation of common names and sometimes those common names were different purely because of whether the trailing axle had inside journals or outside journals, for instance. And it was in that environment that Mr. Sanderson presented his paper. Now, Mr. Sanderson thought that a general classification system needed to do three things. It needed to give a mental picture of the locomotive. It needed to give an indication of that locomotive's power. And thirdly, it needed to tell each Rhodes locomotive bods the particular make of the locomotive so classified. Now one, the mental picture, is pretty much what we've gotten with the white system. And Sanderson would have had to have been living in a cave to not be aware of the white system because by the time he presented his paper it had appeared and been discussed in some of the locomotive trade journals. But Mr. Sanderson was of the view that a system based on wheel arrangement only didn't convey enough information about the locomotive. Hence, his second and third requirement. But what his second and third requirements actually were was a form of cab side notation. Now, I'm not sure if cab side notation was particularly a thing in 1900 or so, but later photographs show that some roads were heavily into capside notation. It's not something that my road, the NZGR, were into. We got a class ID, we got a road number, and on occasions we got that the locomotive belonged to the people of New Zealand. And plenty of other roads didn't bother either. The AT and SF simply wrote AT and SF on the cab side. Other roads were into capside notation, but hardly in a standard way. The Union Pacific and Southern Pacific were heavily into it. 
and because of their Harriman association, there were some similarities in their cab side notation system. Class identification, driver height, weight on the drivers, cylinder size, whether or not it was superheated, but not in 1900, obviously, whether or not it was a stoker, for instance. Those sorts of things were on the cab side. The Missouri Pacific displayed class ID, driver height, tractive effort, the Cooper Bridge rating, which is Cooper 40 is a rating based on whether or not a bridge could handle two consolidation locomotives with an axle load of 40,000 pounds, double heading a continuous train of freight wagons across a bridge at, I think from memory, 10 miles per hour. But that won't be in the test, so don't worry about it. Now here comes four locomotives that I picked by putting a random number into the Denver Public Library catalogue. By way of illustration of the Sanderson system, these locomotives would have been known as a C64J, C for consolidation, 64 meaning that it could haul 6,400 tonnes at 10 miles per hour on a level track. J I'll get to a bit later. Uh, this one here, Union Pacific number 7020, it is of course a 482, but under the Sanderson system, at the time it rolled into traffic, it would have been known as an O95A. And I'll get into O a little bit later as well. This one here, the ATNSF number 558, we know it as a 442. Under the Sanderson system, it's A for Atlantic, 34C. 34 because it could haul 3,400 tonnes at 10 miles per hour on a level track. C because it's the third iteration of that type of locomotive on that road. ABC for one, two, three, the third iteration. Why you would want to haul 3,400 tonnes of freight at 10 miles per hour with an Atlantic is beyond me, but there you go, it illustrates one of the reasons why the Sanderson system wasn't adopted. This one here, Southern Pacific 2353, is a 460 or a 10 wheeler. Hence, under Sanderson's system, it is a T67, 6,700 tonnes at 10 miles per hour. And I've noted it as an AK because it is the, goes through the alphabet once to get to 26, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. It's the 37th iteration of a 460 locomotive on the Southern Pacific at the time it rolled into service. Now, to be fair to Mr. Sanderson, I couldn't be bothered working out what letter it should have. The earlier T's would have developed a different tractive effort and therefore would have been able to haul a different load at 10 miles per hour on a level track. But what this does illustrate is that you need to do a lot of work to get the Sanderson classification. Whereas with the white classification, you just need to take a quick gander at the wheels, do some very straightforward counting in your head, and there you've got it, right? 460. Now there's a couple of other points to note about Mr. Sanderson's system. One is that he accepted that the tonnage rating was based on rated tractive effort, and there was a difference between a locomotive having a rated tractive effort and being able to produce enough steam to haul at 10 miles per hour all of that weight for hour after hour. So he reasoned that if a locomotive was a poor steamer, the rating should be downrated a bit. Now anyway, the O, that came up later in the feedback and I'll get to that shortly because there was feedback and a lot of it. Mr. Gaines, the mechanical engineer for the Lehigh Valley, was happy enough with identifying a letter or the common name, but wondered where compounding would be noted, for instance. He also doubted whether or not the system would be flexible enough for future developments. And he also wanted driver height to be taken into account. Mr. Leeds pointed out that on his road, although I don't know which road that was, classification was done by road numbers. For instance, 
their locomotives with 17 by 24 inch cylinders and 57 inch drivers had road numbers from 1 to 55. I think he just wanted to join in. Mr West, again not sure which road he came from, pointed out that the yard masters knew which locomotives were good steamers and which ones were poor steamers and they would assign the good locomotives to the heavy train weights and the poor locomotives to the light weights and they simply wouldn't bother looking at any classification system. Mr Frederick Metvin White stood up. He said that the system needed to be simple and that his system was entirely that. He used the word scientific, which simply meant count the wheels. And he reasoned that each road could simply build on top of the 460, for instance, with whatever additional classification they wanted. Now, he was quick to point out that the white wheel arrangement system was developed in conjunction with Mr. Bashford from the American Engineer, a trade journal, and Mr. Pomeroy from one of the manufacturers that would soon become part of Alco. Both of those individuals are important a bit later in the story. Mr. Sinclair, the editor and publisher of the Railway and Locomotive Engineering Periodical, and author of numerous books on locomotive development and future president of the Association of Master Mechanics stood up to wholeheartedly endorse Mr Sanderson's system. I do wonder if that was because the rival publication, American Engineer, had already been promoting white system. Don't know, it could be. Mr Fowler stood up. He was, as far as I can gather, a sales rep for one of the manufacturers. He supported the white system because in his experience, traveling around multiple roads and talking to multiple mechanical engineers, the common names had ceased to be relevant. There were multiple names, for instance, for 442 locomotives. So he reasoned, why not simply call them the 442? Mr. Sanderson stood up to plug some gaps in his hard work. He introduced the concept of O for new wheel arrangements that hadn't yet received their common name. Interestingly, his system adopted P for Prairie, even though we know, looking back, that the Prairie type was a blip in history, and that P for Pacific, or Passchendaele if you're me, was a much more long-lived and much more heavily used type. So flexibility for the future, clearly an issue, which is why I used it for the mountain type that I illustrated earlier. And discussion pretty much died at that stage. There was no appetite among the membership to adopt anything at that time, and they were happy to refer it to committee. What happened though was that the adoption of common classification shifted from the conference floor and into the pages of the trade magazines, most notably the American Engineer. And in those pages, Mr. White explained that he did his notation from front to back, even though on most locomotive plans, reading from left to right, the code should be back to front. He reasoned that the mental picture is one of the locomotive approaching us, and I think he's right. I don't think it would fit to call a 462 or 264 because that's the way the majority of plans were drawn. Correspondence letters to the editor were written wondering whether different symbols should be used to illustrate locomotives with outside journals instead of inside journals on their trailing axles. Others wondered if the size of the tender should be noted six-wheeler, eight-wheeler, 12-wheeler, whatever. But the key point for the adoption of the white notation was that the newly established ALCO adopted it. And at the time that ALCO adopted it, so did the American engineer. And with those two entities using the white notation, it very, very quickly became industry-wide and it became industry-wide because of its simple nature. So there you go, like, subscribe, enjoy. Cheers.